have you ever thought about who it is you want to be? Not what you want to be, but who you want to be. Like, I want to be a person who doesn't run into the wall when I'm talking to people as I'm walking. Like, I want to be that kind of person, right? Like, oftentimes we think about what we want to be, especially when we're kids. And now for those of us who are adults, often when we talk to kids about their future, we talk to them in terms of what you want to be when you grow up. But have you ever thought about who you want to be? Like, what type of person do you want to be? Yesterday afternoon was the memorial service for Stuart Briscoe. And it was a, a really moving and meaningful service, almost two hours long. And it just was, I mean, one, it went by like that, but just full of amazing stories about Stuart. And you just think about the legacy that he left, what, what he did when he arrived, and just how many people came to know the Lord through his ministry. As I hear stories, more and more stories about his ministry, it sounds as though there was a revival of sorts through the southeast region of Wisconsin through his ministry. But what was really striking yesterday in the service was not so much what people said about what he did, but more people talked about who he was. Right? There, there wasn't a whole lot of mention of the numbers of people or the building campaigns or how vast his ministry was. It was stories about his character, about his kindness, and his gentleness, how he never thought too highly of himself, and he had a great sense of humor and had the ability to laugh at himself. I can remember my first year here, um, we're getting ready for second service, and I'm just standing in the lobby, and somebody leans over and like says, Stuart's here today. And I'm like, what? Like, why? Like, why is, why is he here? Like, I should turn over the microphone to him and let him speak. And so we went through the service, gave my message, and he came up to me and just was so encouraging. Like, was, like you could tell, like, in his mind, it wasn't about him. It was about who God is and what God has done through him. And yesterday, we sat for two hours and heard about who he was. And so the question for us this morning is who do you want to be? Like, what type of person do you want to be? When you come to the end of your life and people are going to speak about who you were, what is it you hope that they will say? What is it that you will hope that they say about who you were? So who do you want to be? And then the, the other question we have to ask is how are you going to become that person? Who is it that you want to be and then how are you going to become that person? At the end of chapter 12 in the book of Romans, Paul lists out and shares who he hopes the church in Rome will be. And I would suggest he hopes that the same is true of us. That we would be the type of people described in our passage this morning. And this is what we read. This is chapter 12. Verses 9 through 21, Paul writes, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take re revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, a passage like this is actually somewhat common 
in Paul's writing. When you find passages like this, oftentimes they're near the end of his letter. A a typical letter format for Paul is that he'll spend the first half or maybe the first two-thirds of the letter talking about theology and talking about context and situations, what's happening in the community to which he's writing. And then usually the last half or maybe the last third, he's talking about practical things you can do in response. Essentially, it's as though he's saying, if this is who God is, and this is the world that you're living in, You should think about living in this way. And it's not unusual for Paul to maximize and try and be efficient with his words. And when he moves to that practical portion of the letter, he starts to list things out. Scholars and commentators call these passages virtue passages or virtue lists. Because in this passage, there's about 25, depending on how you count, There's about 25 directives in this list for how you should live. And some of the directives uh, are speaking to the same virtue. It maybe doesn't actually use the word humility, for example, but you see the virtue of humility come through. And when you kind of distill the list to the different virtues that it's discussing, you can find about 15 or so in this passage. This is them. These are the virtues that I pulled out from this list as I read through it. Paul is calling us to be humble, to be people who serve and are generous with our resources, to be passionate in our faith, to have integrity so we are consistent both in our public life and in our private life, that we would be people who are perseverant through hard times, that we would practice hospitality, not just to our friends, but even to strangers and people we don't know. That we would be peaceable across the board, not stirring up strife or anguish, but we would be sowers of peace. That we would be motivated by compassion, that our heart would break for the world around us. That we would be prayerful in all things. That we would be devoted to one another, fiercely devoted to one another. That we would be forgiving, we would be characterized by joy, and we would even go so far as to love our enemies. Like, that's what Paul is saying in this passage. And it raises the question for us, that question being, like, what am I supposed to do with this list of virtues that Paul is netting out? Like, I don't know about you, but when I read passages like this, I get a little overwhelmed. I'm like, it's only about three short paragraphs of text, but there is so much packed in there. And I look at that list and I'm like, how in the world am I supposed to keep track as to whether or not I am doing and being that sort of person? Like, what am I supposed to do with this list? Am I supposed to print it out and put it on my fridge and check in daily? Was I compassionate today? Check. Did I sow peace rather than discord? Check. Was I hospitable to all I met? Check. Is that how am I supposed to engage with this list? Or, I wonder, is Paul doing something else with this list? Meaning, I wonder if what Paul is doing here is rather than giving us a checklist for how we're supposed to live, maybe he's trying to cast vision. Cast vision for who he wants us to become. To say, like, this type of life is possible for you. It is possible for you to be this person. It is possible for you to live in this way. It's almost as though you have a person who's like a mentor, Paul being our mentor, and us being his mentees, and he's encouraging us. He sees the potential in us, and he's trying to call us up into something bigger and greater for our lives. It's kind of like the scene in Remember the Titans, where Coach Boone wakes his team up early in the morning at training camp. And they run this, I don't know, three, four mile run at like five in the morning or whatever to the graveyard at Gettysburg. And he shows them this is the field where this battle was fought. He says, men, your age, this green field was painted red, bubbling with blood, smoke and hot lead pushing through their bodies. And then he goes on to say, and we are fighting the same fight that they were fighting then. This fight over who's right, this picture of division. 
And he's trying to take this racially diverse team in a season of integration and show them that they have the capacity to be one. And he says near the end, if nothing else, maybe you'll learn to respect one another. And then he throws in, and maybe we'll win a few football games along the way. As though to say there's something greater than the game. It's the person you become. You have the potential to become a person who is marked by dignity and respect and show that dignity and respect for all people. You can become that person. And so the question is, do you want to be that person? Who do you want to be? I think Paul is doing the same thing with this list. He's trying to show that we have the potential and we have the capacity to become this kind of person. The question is, do we desire to be that person? Now, what Paul is doing in this passage, I think, is he's starting to show that what it means to be this type of person kind of occupies two different contexts, two different spheres in your life that you kind of move between on a regular basis. Two spheres of life. The first sphere is who we are in the context of community. Right, the New Testament assumption for those who are Christians is that there is no Lone Ranger Christians. Right, th- th- there's no such thing as a Christian who says, I'm going to just hang out, me and Jesus, and live my life that way. Like the New Testament doesn't have a vision for that. The New Testament doesn't have any capacity for that. The assumption is that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you live your life in community with other Christians. One of the common phrases that you hear today is that, like, I love Jesus, but I'm done with the church. And I'm actually really sympathetic towards that mindset because there are plenty of scenarios and places and moments where the church has not done a good job of leading the way and being the people that we are called to be. It seems as though we're living in a season where every few months a new pastor is being put on leave or being asked to resign because of some character flaw, some moral failure in their ministry. And just a few weeks ago, there was another one, a a pastor who was super influential in my life early on in my ministry, Never met the guy, big name guy, but listened to his sermons on a weekly basis. Was trying to learn from him and just two weeks ago says he got put on leave because of an inappropriate relationship with a congregation member. Now fortunately, this inappropriate relationship was just through messaging, meaning there was no physical thing, there wasn't an affair. But they said it was the frequency and the familiarity with which he was communicating with this congregation member, and it got brought to the light, and he's put on leave. And my initial thought when I read that story was, is that it? Like, or is there something else? Like, is this the first step, and then another shoe is going to drop, and we're going to learn more? Because what we're seeing in the church is a crisis in leadership. Like, pastors and church leaders not being the people that God has called us to be. Like there's a disconnect between who we are in our public life and who we are behind closed doors. And Paul is trying to say, who is it that you want to be? And it's not just for leaders. It's for anybody who says that they are a follower of Jesus. And in this passage, Paul, near the first part of this passage, is using a few phrases that highlight that he's talking about it's important to be in community, in a local church. One of the phrases that he will use is a simple phrase, one another. He uses it three times. He he talks about who we are called to be towards one another. He, He says that we are called to be devoted to one another. He says we are called to honor one another in verse 10. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, to live in harmony with one another. The only way you do those things to another person is if you live in community with them. He he uses this term one another to highlight the reality of living in community. The, The other thing that he calls us to do is share. He says to share with the Lord's people. Again, assuming that you are living in community, you know the needs of other people, and you have the ability and capacity and generosity to share with them what you have. And the reason community is so important in the church is because you can't fully experience God 
in isolation. You can't have fully experienced God in isolation, in part because God is community. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been living in community. I don't know how that works, right? I don't understand the details of the Trinity. But we learn that God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit, all wrapped up in one. So at the beginning of time, before he ever created anything, God is living in community. God didn't create the world because he was bored. He didn't create the world because he was lonely. His creation of the world was simply an outflow or an overflow of who he is in his relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we can't fully experience God unless we are experiencing him in the context of community. And I'm guessing this morning, part of the reason why you're here is in part because you do want to fully experience God. You take the time and effort to get here from one Sunday to the next because you want to know God. You want to experience God. And Paul is saying one of the ways we do that is in the context of community, in the context of sharing our life and living our life alongside other people. Now, the other sphere of life in which Paul is calling us to be a certain type of person isn't only who we are in community, but it's also who we are towards the community, meaning that the community around us, the community in which this church is embedded. If Paul is talking about two spheres of life, one is the church, the other is the world. And if one assumption of the Bible is that we're supposed to live the Christian life in community, the other assumption of the Bible is that we do so towards the world around us, not in isolation from the world, but to bear witness to the world. But sometimes... Moving towards a community is hard because it's not always well received. And there's two points of tension in this passage that highlight the fact that sometimes bearing witness to the love of Christ can be difficult. Paul says in verse 14, bless those who persecute you. We don't really have a good understanding of what it means to be persecuted for our faith in this country because, by and large, it's pretty comfortable for us. But in the first century, Christians were regularly targeted, both by the unbelieving world and the Jewish community, to say, hey, we want nothing to do with this Jesus who you say is the new king of the world. And they were fiercely persecuted. And Paul is saying, bless them. Don't retaliate, but bless And then he goes on to say, here's what it means for you to actually treat your enemy. Not only bless them, but then treat them in a certain way and serve them and love them. Paul is talking about what it means to be a certain type of person in community. He's also talking about what it means to be a certain type of person towards the community around us. Now, what's interesting in this passage, when you read it all the way through, it's almost as though you can identify the two spheres that Paul is talking about as you read the passage through. Meaning the first part of the passage, it seems to be clear that he's talking about loving those in the church. He's using that one another language and some other things. And then you get to the end and he's talking about your enemies and those who persecute you. And you would hope that your enemy doesn't come from within the church, right? You would hope that those who are persecuting you are not coming from within, but out. But then there seems to be this overlap. There seems to be this overlap in the middle. Meaning in verse 14, he's talking about bless those who persecute you, he says. But then on either side, which seems to be how you would engage with the world. But then on either side of that directive, there's a directive on how you live in community. Verse 13, he says... Share with the Lord's people. Share with those in need. Share with those who are in the church. And then in verse 16, he's talking about live in harmony with one another. Seemingly saying live in harmony with those in the church. So it seems as though he's talking about these two spheres of influence. And then by the middle of the passage, he's overlapping these spheres of influence. I wonder if possibly to show how what you need in living in the church and living out in the world is the same thing. The person you need to be is a person of love. Because love leads the list. Love, he says in verse 9, 
must be sincere. Uh, Paul will make a big deal in other parts of the Bible about being a person of love. He spins 1 Corinthians 13, that whole chapter, which we really think, often think that that's the wedding chapter. Like Paul sat down one day and he said, you know, people are going to get married in the church and I need to write something that can be highlighted and read at their wedding. So he wrote verse thir- or 1 Corinthians 13. It's actually not the case. We just apply it because it's all about love. He highlights the significance and the importance in love. In love, And at the end of that chapter, he says, these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love leads the list. If you think of the fruit of the Spirit, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, and then go the rest. Oftentimes, people will say that it's love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. And then everything else that follows is just a descriptor of love. I think you could say the same thing about the virtue list in this passage. I think you could say, like, if you look at all those virtues we put up there before at the beginning, right? If you look at all 15 of them, they're all simply a descriptor of love. Love leads the list, and these descriptors just give texture and detail to what it looks like to be a person of love. And so we ask the question at the beginning, who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? The question for us really is, do you want to be a person of love? Do you want to be a person who is marked first and foremost by love? Would people say that is true of you currently? When they think of you, when you are brought to mind, do they think, oh, that person, yes. Man, they are so loving. Or would they use other words to describe who you are? Now, I'm going to guess to that question, do you want to be a person of love? You're going to say yes. I'm going to guess that you're going to say yes. In part, because love in our society is prioritized. Love in our society is really trendy right now. Like we're trying to be a loving society, a loving community. And one of the ways you see that is there's this slogan that's out there all the time, love is love, right? People heard this, seen it on like front yard signs, right? Which sounds great, but we really have to define what is love. Because when our society says love is love, what our society really is talking about is tolerance. Just let me be who I want to be. Just accept me for who I say that I am, and I'll do the same for you. Love in our culture is tolerance. But when Paul writes about love in the New Testament, he's not talking about tolerance. He's talking about sacrifice. True love in the scriptures is about sacrificial service. It's about giving yourself for the sake of somebody else, even at the expense of yourself, even if you never get paid back in return. And you see that through this passage. There's this downward trajectory of what it means to be a person of love, to share with somebody who has a need. And it doesn't say, and they will pay you back tenfold. It just says share and give. It says, don't be worried about associating with people who are in a low position. Go to them. Lower yourself for the sake of serving them. Give over yourself for the sake of other people. And so the question is, are are we willing to do that? And I think what's really fascinating about this passage is that the way that it ends, it ends with the most extreme version of loving somebody. The most extreme sacrificial act is to love your enemy, he says. Because when you are wronged, you can respond in one of two ways, he's saying. When an offense comes against you, you can either take matters into your own hands and say, I'm going to go net out justice on my terms, and I'm going to get that person back. That's one way that you could respond. The other way is to put it in God's hands. And he says, trust that I will net out justice. We are fascinated, I think, as a culture by revenge. We love a good revenge story, right? Anybody here ever fantasize about getting back at somebody? You're like, if I had a chance, this is what I would tell them. This is what I would tell everybody else about them. This is what I would do, right? Like this week, I get a a weekly 
uh, Netflix email, write them on their email list. Here's what's on Netflix this week. Headline this week, top, top video, a video, a movie titled Do Revenge. It's all about these high school kids who are getting back at each other. I don't know, but I was like, how fascinating. Like, our culture loves getting even. We love doing it on our terms, but the invitation of the Bible is to let God be the one who nets out justice in the end. Our responsibility is to be somebody who loves. So we could be people who go after revenge, but Paul is saying here, the call of following Jesus is to resist revenge. This is a picture of a guy named Dietrich Pajorg, I think is how you say his last name. He is a pastor in Albania. And there's a massive leadership, or excuse me, a massive relationship crisis in northern Albania that's known as blood feuds. Like still happening to this day. When you read about it, when you learn about it, it sounds like something from, you know, centuries ago. But this is a current reality that blood feuds exist as a reality in Albania today. So meaning if somebody in your family kills somebody else in another family, The blood feud mentality is that family has an obligation, a duty to retaliate and take the life of somebody in your family. It doesn't have to even be the person who did the initial killing. It could just be anybody in the family to show that we get the last word, to show that we are netting out justice. And reports say that the justice system in northern Albania is pretty weak and it's just allowing this cycle of violence and revenge to continue and to keep going. And so this pastor, Dietrich, his family was wrapped up in a blood feud. Years ago, his uncle killed somebody. And when that happens, family members who are wrapped up in a blood feud will spend years never going outdoors. They will spend years locked up in their house for fear of losing their life. And he got to the point where he said, enough is enough. I'm not going to live my life in fear but I'm going to continue to live my life devoted to following Jesus. Now, it's also said that if you're traveling with men, uh, if men are traveling with women or children, there's, you know, some protection that is offered, so you may not lose your life. But there was one day he was walking out the door of his church to go pick up his kids from school, and he was gunned down and killed on the steps of his church. 34 years old. And he said to his brother, before he died, he said, if either of us loses our lives in this blood feud. We are making a commitment today not to retaliate, to let the blood feud die with us and our family so that one, our family can be safe and we can end this perpetual cycle of violence in our community. I mean, talk about a hero. Talk about somebody who understands what it means to be a committed, devoted follower of Jesus, that I am risking my life for the sake of my community. Now, I realize that's a really extreme example, and hopefully none of us are wrapped up in blood feuds in our culture. We would hope that our justice system is strong enough to protect us against that. But the question is, what about when somebody takes credit for your idea, and it fires you up, and you really want to let everybody know what a jerk that person is, and how you're the one who originated that idea? Or what if somebody intentionally tarnishes your reputation by spreading rumors about you? What is your initial response back to that person? Like, are we going to be people who are people of love, who understand the cost of following Jesus and be sincere in our love, or are we gonna take matters into our own hands? So do you wanna be a person of love? Initially, I assumed you said yes. Maybe you're thinking differently now. Because love comes with a big cost. And if you are still saying yes, the question is how? Like, how do I become that person? How do I become somebody who truly, authentically, sincerely loves? I think the key comes in verse 2 of chapter 12. Paul says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't be conformed to the violence and the revenge seeking of this world. Rather, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. See, Paul is saying that renewed thinking leads to gospel living. 
Renewed thinking leads to gospel living, specifically embodying the love of Jesus Christ. Renewed thinking isn't like, hey, I just need to get more Bible info in my head. Renewed thinking is I need my mind, my heart, my will, all of who I am to be shaped by the message of the gospel. And the more that we realize who Jesus is and specifically what he has done for us, and we fall in love with that, we will become people who naturally love. See, the reason why Paul says that we are called to associate with people in low position, the reason why we can do that is only because Jesus has done that for us. That's what Paul says in Philippians 2, that God, being equal, Jesus, being equal with God, did not consider his equality with God something to be taken to his own advantage. Rather, he emptied himself and became nothing, taking the form of a human likened to being a servant, and he found his way, sacrificing his life for the world. The reason that we can be devoted in community to people who are hard to love is because we realize that Jesus has been first and foremost devoted to us, and sometimes we're hard to love, if you're honest with yourself. The reason we can resist revenge is because we see Jesus resisted revenge. When he was on the cross, he had every opportunity to call down curses on those who was cursing him, but instead, he forgave them. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. See, the reason we can love and serve our enemies is because Jesus died for us. And Paul says, at one time, we were enemies. We were enemies of God. See, becoming a person of sacrificial love happens only when you see and experience the sacrificial love that Jesus has for you. And the way that he is consistent and faithful in his pursuit of you, regardless of what you've done and where you've been. And I wonder, I wonder what would happen if an entire church became that person. If an entire church became the type of person that Paul is talking about here, that love would be sincere, that we would associate with those who are lonely, that we would, or lowly, that we would be compassionate and devoted, that we would be generous and we would love people who are hard to love, even those who come against us. What was really fascinating, the, the days or weeks after Dietrin in North Albania died, was his church rallied together and they went to the capital and put on a rally, the capital of the country, and they had this mantra for their rally that it's, it's manly to forgive. And they caught the attention of the media. It was all over the newspapers, all over the news, that a church was trying to counteract the cycle of violence in their country by showing that there was a different and better way. And when a whole church catches a vision for what it means to be a person of love, like it can turn heads and people can say, yes, I want that. Because living in this cycle of violence, living in this cycle of dysfunction, living in this cycle of toxicity, trying to be my own judge and mete out justice in the world is wearing me out. And what I really need is hope. I need hope that there is a different and better way to live. And so here's what I want to do to finish our time. And I'm going to invite the worship team to, to come on up front. I'm going to read this passage one more time, the whole thing. And I want you to ask the question, what about this passage really strikes me? Meaning, is there a certain area in my life where God might be inviting me to engage with him to become the type of person he's talking about in this list? And there might even be somebody who comes to mind who you know that your love towards them has been half-hearted or your love towards them has been... Um, bit of a hypocrisy. And for you to say, what would it look like for me to embody this list or one feature of this list towards that person to become the person that God has called me to do? So to open yourself up to hear that from the Lord as I read this list again, to say, yes, that one directive is a way that I can practice being a person of love in my everyday life, maybe even towards this specific person. And then for you to take that with you this week, to write it down, 
put a notification in your phone to say, Lord, I'm, I'm committing myself to you to learn from you what it means to be a person of sacrificial, sincere love in my life. So I invite you to maybe just posture yourself in a place of prayer. You can open your hands. You can close your eyes and just let this list wash over you and see which one sticks out and see if there's a certain individual that comes to mind. Paul writes, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people in low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Lord, we ask that we would become people who love, who love sincerely, without hypocrisy, that we could be people who are marked by love. Lord, I pray that we would count the cost of what it means to be a truly loving person, that we would be willing to do so even at the expense of ourselves. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to you this morning. As we sang earlier, saying, Lord, we need you. We need you to be and do for us what only and who only you can be in our lives. Teach us to love like you. Pray this in your name. Amen.